Hello and welcome to the Majlis Podcast, Radio Free of Radio Liberty's current affairs talk show focusing on Central Asia. I'm Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis and Radio Free of Radio Liberty's media manager here in Washington, D.C. It's been more than two years since uh, ISIS lost its last physical stronghold in Raqqa, Syria. With this, thousands of ISIS foreign fighters along with their wives and children have remained in limbo, mostly in Iraqi custody or in Kurdish detention facilities in northern Syria. Those fighters have come from very various countries and many countries do not want to see those people come back home. However, Kazakhstan decided to look the other way and repatriated hundreds of its citizens from the Middle East. Since then, while some of the fighters were put in jail, their children and wives have been placed in rigorous rehabilitation and the radicalization programs. In the fresh documentary just released by Radio Free Europe the Liberty's Kazakh service, journalist Shahida Toligonova and her crew revisit some of the critical questions about Kazakhstan's repatriation process and its success and failures. So in this episode of the Majlis podcast, we decided to look into what happens once those fighters return to Kazakhstan and how the whole project has been going so far. To discuss all these, I'm joined by Dr. Vera Mironova, a research fellow at the Harvard University and the author of the award-winning book From Freedom Fighters to Jihadist and Non-State Armed Groups Human Resources. She personally interviewed hundreds of ISIS and Al-Qaeda fighters. Shahida Toliganova is with us, who is the award-winning documentary filmmaker and the author of the Second Chance, the documentary, which is the subject of our discussion today. And Bruce Panier, the editor of Radio Free of Radio Liberty Central Asia blog, Kishlok Owazi. Thank you, colleagues, and welcome on board. So, Shahida, congratulations on the completion of another terrific project. So, why not you kick in and start the conversation by telling us about the project and perhaps some of your main findings in that? The reason I wanted to make this film is that a lot of conversation, a lot of uh, videos and uh, reports have been made on the subject of returning ISIS members, especially women and children, and along with cousins. Kazakhstan, some other Central Asian countries like Uzbekistan and uh, Kyrgyzstan taking their citizen back, Russians, Russia did, and a few other countries. And uh, the Western governments, meaning the United States and Britain and France and Australia, are very, very reluctant to do so. So it was interesting for me not only to listen to the stories of women who came back home to Kazakhstan, but also talk to the people who worked with them, like the imams, the theologists, the psychologists, who went through this whole mind-blowing transformation because these people, unlike the, the returnees, the former ISIS members, the theologists and psychologists has never seen the war. They never been challenged the face with extreme ideologies like that. And it was interesting to see how they viewed these people from the point of their mm. arrival back to Kazakhstan two years on and uh, talk about the successes and perhaps failures of this quite unprecedented program of rehabilitation of uh, ISIS uh, returnees. Now, these are terrific details that you're talking about, Shahida. We are going to get uh, to this. Um, first, just some uh, factual data from the documentary you presented. So the number we are talking about here is around 500 people, right? The, the ones who are repatriated. Well, 500 people uh, plus minus from the first, the operation took part, there was six or five stages of the operation of repatriation. First one happened in January 2019, and then in spring 2019, that's when about 500 people were taken back. After that, there were another three stages of this uh, special operation to return people, and it, the whole thing was completed in February this year. At this point, the Kazakh government said that, well, practically we took everyone who wanted to be taken home, and that's pretty much it. However, I do suspect, and I think Dr. Mironov will know more details about that, that there are some other Kazakh children still in the camp in Al-Hol, in the Kurdish-controlled uh, areas. And probably, I, I believe that Kazakh government will still try to get these children back home because, again, as the advisor to the president of Kazakhstan, Ilan Karin, pointed out, the main reason Kazakhstan took these people back is for the sake of children. You know, because children have no, they're not to blame what their parents did. It's extremely unfair to keep them in these horrific conditions. Uh, they've already been traumatized by the scenes of war. They're traumatized even more by living in the camp. And that was one of the main reasons the Kazakh government decided to bring these people back. 
And uh, of course, as it is shown in the documentary, that most of those people who were repatriated were female and children, and there were also some grown-ups, right? Yeah, there were some men as well, but I think most of them are in, in the prisons. Hmm. It's very difficult to understand what these people's role in the Islamic State was. I mean, I, I, I think with the, in the case of men, it's pretty much straightforward. They probably, most of them were fighters or participated in some sort of armed uh, activity. But with women, we don't know because most of them claim hmm. that they've been just housewives, but sitting at home, raising children, this, that. How do you verify if they're saying truth or not? You know, because how, the how... narrative of the stories is the same. I followed my husband. I followed yeah, my husband. Yeah. And actually, in the course of this film, I met only one woman. She's not part of the film. She, who went to join the Islamic State in actually in mid-2016, when things are quite rough over there. Mm-hmm. She went willingly herself, mm. you know, with her husband, with her anything. And she really was committed to the ideas of... Uh, Oh, so-called Halifat. Mm. You know, that uh, kind of uh, brings two questions across my mind, Shahida. First is how uh, they are treated once they are back in Kazakhstan in terms of how they differentiate between one person to the other in terms of the uh, process forward. But that I will come back in a minute. But before that, let me bring in uh, Dr. Minruba. The other leg of the question that, that I wanted to raise uh, from the comments just made by Shahida is, so the categories in which those people are selected in Syria to be brought back in to, to Kazakhstan, like uh, what Shahida is saying, like, you know, uh, first of all, of course, you know, the determination, I guess, this is my own commentary here, I guess it starts from Syria when they are being picked up by the Kazakh authorities, I guess, or maybe there are some mediators, I don't know. Please also enlighten us if there's any insight you have on that kind of a selection process there. So how they determine who should be brought back to Kazakhstan? As far as I know, Kazakhstan took everyone they were able to take who are Kazakh citizens. On the other side, there are still several families who managed to escape first and second. There are, as far as I know, two extended families who are still in uh, in a camp because when Kazakhstan was taking their citizens, they managed to hide. Very unpleasant people, you know, to be fair. They were involved in some problems in the camp. That's how we learned about that. How many people are still there? I mean, as you said in earlier, Shaida also mentioned that. I mean, Kazakh authorities say they brought back anyone from Kazakhstan who wanted to come back, right? If that is the situation. So how many people we think are still there in, in, in Syria from Kazakhstan? I'm was able to count two families in Syria or in 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 a camp. In, you know, those are two different questions. In a in a Kurdish custody, I managed to count two families. So one has something like three adults hmm. and five kids, and the second one is also around five people. So we also expect that there might be people who are not in the in, in those camps. Well, absolutely. I mean, first of all, there are still Kazakh citizens fighting in Idlib area and. And also there are Kazakh ISIS members who managed to escape from uh, Kurdish-controlled territories to Idlib and, you know, maybe even to Turkey now. Mm -hmm. Why do they escape? Well, because they don't want to go home. They don't, either they are too radical to even consider, you know, coming back from terrible non-Muslim country, according to them. Mm. Or they just, you know, they just simply think that they would be imprisoned at home and they don't want to do that. As you said, you met a couple of them in the camps. So what was your own impression after meeting those people? What kind of feelings you uh, you came out of those meetings? Well, I'm in communication with a lot of uh, Russian-speaking former USSR folks in those camps. And, you know, what is my impression? I mean, first of all, the ISIS members of ISIS. What, What impression can you possibly have from members of ISIS? Are they still supporting ISIS? Some of them do and some don't. It's different. But, you know, if you go there, those who do, they throw stones at you, you know, call you Mm. different bad names. Very unpleasant place to be in to start with. Wow. Very interesting. We are talking about Kazakhstan today, but along with Kazakhstan, we have also seen earlier Uzbekistan bringing back some of its citizens from Iraq and Syria. And I guess Tajikistan also started. Uh, in fact, Tajikistan started with uh, repatriating minors from Iraq. Um, so how the Kazakh case is kind of compared with those countries? Kazakhstan took everyone, everyone they could take, let's say could take, right? Mm. Then Uzbekistan, as far as I know, took 
overwhelming majority. I know there's some Uzbeks left. Uh, but also keep in mind that women in camps hide their citizenship. So, for example, mm. you know, she could say if she has double citizenship with, you know, Uzbekistan and Russia or Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan, she would play whatever citizenship suits her well, right? Mm. So we are not talking about those people. So Uzbekistan took a lot. Tajikistan did not take any female members yet. So they only repatriated kids from Baghdad prison. It's a very different story. We could not mix them together. So uh, and approaches here are very different. So while Kazakhstan put in prison at least some mm. uh, female members of ISIS, mm. I think like something like 15 they imprisoned. Mm. Uzbekistan did not imprison even one female member of ISIS, which, you know, is ridiculous, right? And we know that there were Uzbek women who were, who were keeping slaves. Mm. We know that there were Uzbek women who were participating in fighting units. ISIS had two female fighting units, Naisha and Nuseiba. So we know that there were Uzbek citizens there. We know that female Uzbekistan citizens were working for Armia, uh, which is, you know, ISIS in intelligence, internal intelligence. So, you know, there are obvious questions like why those people are not in prison. And in many cases, they're even given benefit, free housing, free medical, you know, some kind of other cash payments. Really? What's the for logic? ISIS members. What's the logic? And, and uh, Tajikistan. Wait, uh, and Tajikistan went a different road. So, for example, Tajikistan is not repa- did not repatriate any female member yet because their intelligence services are working in prepare- preparation of individual cases. You know, because it takes time. You could not just bring them in a country and let them go, like, for example, Uzbekistan did, right? So, you know, they are preparing to repatriate them, but when they are ready to- with a file for each of them. Mm, interesting. I think you were surprised by some of the way they, they are treating these people. Uh, what's the logic behind the way Uzbekistan is treating, especially the, uh, you said, none of the uh, female returnees are placed in jail? Or... Well, technically, they're claiming that, or oh, they're poor women, you know, brought there by their husband, they're innocent, which, you know, is not true. So I think it's a decision made by someone up in the government, and no one could say, basically, guys, what are you doing? So that's yeah. that's a big problem. You know, they're going to realize sooner or later when someone does something, and yeah. Already, we could see that a lot of money is to 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 fund terrorist organizations, right? In Afghanistan and mm. Syria, they are facilitated by women who are returned. And I know for a fact that some of that is facilitated by women returned to Uzbekistan. Wow, you know there are so, so not only they are not prosecuted for their previous crimes they did in Syria, right? Mm. But also, like right now, they still continue doing what they were doing. Very, very dangerous. Very interesting. Um, uh, Bruce, so I'm faced with a sea of information here. So please help me to treat the uh, brain of our uh, guest speakers today. And also in the meantime, Bruce, you know, we are sort of drawing comparison between Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. So what do you see standing out here to you? You know, obviously, they, there's some different approaches. As Dr. Uh, Mironova said that, you know, the Tajiks haven't brought back any adults hmm. at all. And, and um, you know, generally, not many men have come back, young men have come back for obvious reasons, I think, too. Kyrgyzstan, of course, has taken some back with a lot of help. They got some of their citizens back, too. You know, the thing that always struck me about this, and I'm, ho- I'm hoping neither uh, Dr. Moronova or Shahida can help me out with this, too. I, I like the I like the film about Shahida did with the Kazakh service because that was the first time I got to see what happens to these people you know when they when they just arrive Mm -hmm. they make a there's all kinds of publicity when they actually evacuate them and bring them back home and and then there's a lot of talk about what's going to happen to them what how they're going to try to help some of them maybe get jobs or housing and things like that and and then they just seem to fall off the radar entirely and you're not really sure whatever happened to them five months or a year after they they've come back home Mm -hmm. Uh, but you think there's something out there you know saying here's somebody you know um uh, she in the film that the kazakh service and she did there's the, the woman that owns the works at the restaurant owns it you know you'd think there'd be success stories like that all over yeah. central asia mm-hmm. uh where they've repatriated but here's someone who we brought back you know who understood it was understood it was a huge mistake yeah and they make themselves into something and help the country out uh you know and, and they they fit in again at home you know mm-hmm. that would be like the the natural happy end of the story of evacuating them to begin with but you never get that part you you brought us bruce yeah, to a, to... here for a second just to add up to what bruce said sorry mohammed yeah Actually, I, it's, it's a very good point, Bruce, because it's not a Hollywood happy end story, right? Because while I was there filming with these girls, there were two women who didn't want to be part of the film who came 
and were extremely aggressive and really extremely unpleasant, started demanding money for the interview. And I said, no, I don't give normally money for the interview. Anyway, I said, well, if you don't want to be filmed, it's fine, of course. And then I was sitting down and talking to one of them. She was Russian and she was quite young. And she started saying something. I was like, look, I've been to those parts of Turkey. You know, I know what you're talking about. She was like, oh, it's good to talk to someone who knows. And then she started describing to me how wonderful life in the Islamic State was, that they had everything and everything was great, the house, and she lived, she, it sounds like she lived like a queen, and she actually ran away from Kazakhstan. She's from the city of Uralsk. She ran away at the age of 18 because she, on the internet, met some Chechen guy who was waiting for her there. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So cut the story short. She is the case which I don't I, I consider as a lost case. Th- this woman came back. Yes, yeah, she went to rehab. I spoke to the person who was working with her, like a psychologist and theologist. And they also admitted that she's like, she just pretends that she's changing. She's not. Mm. She's uh, still extremely committed to the ideology of ISIS. How, uh, and this is very important to note that probably the women who you saw in the film Unfortunately, probably at best will be 50% of those returnees uh, who actually 50. decided to start a new life and forget what happened. The rest are so brainwashed that they will be committed to this ideology forever. Wow. So you are saying like, you know, the people that you met so far or the 500 figure that you give uh, Shaida in the film. So you are saying like uh, somewhat half of those people are still believe that what they did was the right thing? There was, a, uh, out of this 500, or now it's almost 700 people returned to Kazakhstan, the vast majority are children, over 400. Mm. We have to bear it in mind. So when, talk, when we're talking about the grown-ups, the adults, we probably talk about like 30%. In terms of the numbers, the women plus minus about 200 and something, they're across Kazakhstan, and I believe the Kazakh authorities do keep an eye on them through this ACNIA, this public foundation for awareness, and they, they have to go with this psychologist and specialists have to go and visit these women. But equally, I've heard that in other areas, like for example, in Aktau, there are issues with these communities of returned women who just don't want to get back into the society. They are quite happy in their ISIS bubble, and that's it, you know. And so, what, what do you do with these people? So, so these are the people, Shahida, uh, that the ones you are referencing to are the ones who have gone through all these uh, rehabilitation process that government is running, right? Yes, they all had to. They all, upon arrival, were placed to this special camp. camp. It's actually a resort in the, uh, on the seaside. So they all had to go through compulsory one month plus minus rehab program. But the, the problem is that one month is not enough. These people live with this ideology for several years. Imagine how much brainwashed you are. Like, you know, so... To get them out and open their eyes and to the different interpretation of Islam is extremely difficult. And uh, as theologists or imams who are working with them do realize that they were not fully equipped. They were preparing, but they were not prepared to face what they actually had to face. And they readjusted very quickly. And actually, I think the Kazakhstan's case could be a very good example for other countries to l- draw lessons from and how to deal with these people. Again, it's not going to be a happy end, happy end story. These people are dangerous, as Dr. Mironova was saying. Uh, some of them are extremely dangerous. And going back to Uzbekistan, it's extremely worrying that the government decides just to let them go free. In a country which is already, we saw the the tendencies for um, more conservative Islam, let's put it this way, I'm not calling it radicalization, given the fact that there are so many Uzbeks actually willingly left to join Al-Qaeda and later on to ISIS and Jafat al-Nusra, and they're still fighting there in Idlib, like Dr. Minoran was saying. Mm-hmm. We have Afghanistan next door, and look at the advances Taliban is making, making to yeah. the Uzbek and Central Asian borders, let's put it this way. If I was in the government of Uzbekistan, especially in the National Security Service, I would have been extremely worried about that. But the approach they took now is very counterproductive, very ill thought through, I would say. Mm.
Wow. But what, Shaida, you are saying, I mean, this, this, this raises another very, I guess, very important, relevant question of, about what happens really in these rehabilitation centers that Kazakh authorities come to Washington and keeps bragging about the, the success of those centers there. I mean, what happens there? Uh, how effective this whole project is? And also, uh, what comes next for those people who are out of those uh, facilities? And what lies ahead for those who have been taken to jail and placed in jail? So let's continue the conversation talking about these and many other questions very shortly. First, let me recap the debate today on the Image List podcast. I'm joined by Dr. Vera Mironova, a research fellow at the Harvard University and the author of the award winning book From uh, Freedom Fighter to Jihadist, Non State Armed Groups, Human Resources. Shahida Tuliganova, award winning documentary filmmaker and the author of The Second Chance, the documentary that we are um, talking about today. And Bruce Panier, the editor of Ready for Free Pre Liberty Central Asia Blog, Kishlok Owazi. I'm Mohammed Tahir, host of the Image List podcast here in Washington, D.C and we are discussing ISIS returnees to Kazakhstan. So the rehabilitation, perhaps feel free, Dr. Mironova or Shahida, whoever wants to jump in here, the rehabilitation centers of Kazakhstan. What really happens there? Well, no one quite knows what's going on there because those governments, after, as you mentioned, proudly reporting that they care about their citizens and they, they, they took them home. After that, everything goes quiet and there is no access, nothing. Only, you know, government officials reporting uh, that, you know, everything is successful and everyone is now, you know, happy, living peacefully together with each other. Well, I think what happens actually happens is that the government realized that those people are not as nice and lovely as they thought they are after bringing them home. And now they are not allowing access to them because, you know, it would look bad. For example, Tajikistan openly, which is weird, right? Tajikistan, Mm -hmm. they put their statistics and information open about it. They're open about it. They said that they had around 100 people who self-returned, right? Mm -hmm. Those are people who went to Syria and then they surrendered to the embassy, let's say, in in Turkey and Mm -hmm. were repatriated. Mm -hmm. Out of them, a lot of them got amnesty in the beginning because Tajikistan was also thinking the same way as Uzbekistan and, and Kazakhstan. But then in two years after that, half of those people were rearrested again. Imagine. But not for the pre- crimes they did before, but what they kept doing. So recruitment, collecting money for those fighting and so on. So now Tajik government said, you know what, done playing with that. Everyone comes in, no more, you know, pictures with flowers. We already got burned. We prepare cases. At least half of those women goes to prison for a long time. Membership in a terrorist organization, which actually everyone has to go, you know, to prison for. Then uh, recruitment, money, support, fighting, a very long list. So that's what they're doing now. They're preparing for repatriation mm. and not just, you know, whatever the leader of the nation said, we're mm. bringing our citizens home. Yeah, it looks like Tajikistan is playing hard now. But, uh, you know, one another country which is playing even harder is Turkmenistan. I guess we just don't know anything about the, the program plans that Turkmenistan might have for people who, who might have joined ISIS in Syria and what's going on with those Turkmens there. Shahida, earlier you brought up this thing, uh, I mean, in terms of the rehabilitation centers. So you said there are psychologists involved in this, there are mullahs there. I mean, uh, just wondered, I mean, who are the stakeholders in this in this entire operation? What are their roles there throughout this process of rehabilitating those people? Right, because uh, I've never been inside one. I can't really say for certain. I can only report from the words of the people who've been there, hmm. meaning that uh, psychologists and uh, the imams and the people who were taken through the rehab process themselves, meaning the women and children. Hmm. So the first thing which was done there is to check everyone's health situation. Hmm. Because as you know, they've been through quite unhygienic conditions and therefore they all have to be checked. So checked and kids had to be vaccinated and etc. etc. Because at the end of the day, no matter what kind of disease they're going to bring, it's going to infect you know, other people outside the camp, right? So this was done. A few people came injured, so they had to be operated and injuries had to be treated, etc., etc. And right after, the 
question answer. I assume they were they were questioned by the uh, Kazakh Secret Service, uh, of course. But uh, equally, the you know Imam started uh, lectures on uh, Hanafi Islam, you know, like traditional Central Asian way of. Um, keeping the religion. Mm. So, yeah, and also then the psychologists joined. The sessions were quite intense. A lot of people originally, and I spoke to several imams. Unfortunately, in the film, you have only one mm. or two, but I spoke to few, and they all said it was extremely difficult because yeah. in, initially the women didn't want to accept whatever they were saying. There was a wall. A total wall and uh, first of all they felt uncomfortable facing a man because they were all coming from some sort of halifat where they were not supposed to see men outside of the house secondly they thought that they're so advanced in their understanding of the religion because they went and uh, there was a certain degree of arrogance you know because mm. they were mm. they actually were trying to build the state man you know they all went to hijra so one actually theologist or imam said to me it was so hard and then we sat down, all the theologists, and to think what to do. And then we thought to approach it from a different point of view. And he was quite, you know, not a young man. He said, I started telling them, look, I'm like your brother. You you came home. I don't really want anything from you. Just, you know, you are my, you are my your brother and your sister. Some of them, even though the, in the camp they were provided with uh, clothes and food and etc., imams themselves on their own money will started trying to bring some toys for kids, some books, hmm. certain little things to make people... And gradually the trust was established. So it's not just immediate process. It took some time, and that's why I do appreciate this honesty of people I spoke to on the other side of rehab, that they admit how difficult it was mm. for them to comprehend, uh, first of all, the ignorance in Islam of these wow. people to start with, and secondly, the stubbornness and belief that they know the best. Mm. And so two years on, and I could see the rapport between the women, especially those who are in the, fil in the film, and the imams, the men they see for lectures. It's genuine. Uh, you can't fake it. You know, I, I'm a pretty experienced <laughs> person. I know when people fake when they don't. And I can see that there is a already relationship and trust between the two sides. And this is the most important thing, which the case of women in the film, because of rehabilitation process, managed to succeed in. Mm. So regardless of the outcome, rehabilitation process of an individual has to end in one month. Is it the way it works? Well, the, the extreme, yes, one month, and then they're allowed to go home. So, yeah, and then they're being monitored by a variety of... Um, how how does of how does that happen? Uh, they home visits. Uh -huh. uh, the ones who are under radar, I mean, those who are like suspected to be more radical than others, they mainly allowed only to be in uh, Nur Sultan, in the capital, under the close eye of the National Security Service. The rest are being kept eye by the local former KGB people, as well as they have visits of the theologists and psychologists. They have to come to lectures at least once a week. Uh, but many of them actually started working, you know, I mean, they don't That's really a... sit at home. I mean, I heard a lot of stories that women work, even actually one woman who's quite radical and extremely unpleasant, somebody who I thought that should belong to the prison rather than to go free. Even she was working as a waitress in a restaurant. Mm. A Muslim restaurant, I mean, like a halal um, restaurant, but still. Yeah, I don't know if you had the chance to speak to, to her co-workers there or perhaps neighbors of those, those people. I mean, how do they look to those people? Uh, it was very difficult. It's uh, and I deliberately didn't want to speak to the neighbors and etc. Because a lot of neighbors and people don't know these women were traveled to the Islamic State and lived somewhere else, and okay. they don't really want. Initially, when they came, when they arrived to Kazakhstan, they're quite open. They spoke to media. They wanted people to like them back because they mm. felt. People looking at public is looking at them as traitors, which I don't know. I mean, I'm not judging anyone. So they wanted to tell the story of how mistreated and how uh, misguided they were. Now, two years on, after they received a lot of negative press locally, they're shy from media and they don't want people to know where they were because also all of them have children. And their children go to kindergartens and to schools. Mm. 
a lot of children are fatherless because I remember mm. this some of the women were married two or three times and every time their husband died of whatever reason she becomes pregnant she delivers a child they don't want it you know mm. so for the sake of children and for the sake of themselves they want less people to know that where they were as possible maybe the the, the, the relatives might know but not the general public very interesting. You know, uh, I recall, in fact, the, the conversation I and a couple of other people had when the Kazakh justice minister was in Washington, D.C. to tell the stories of their repatriation. So he was saying, like, I thought it was a smart idea that he was saying that the, the kids who were born in Syria, they started uh, issuing certificates indicating that those kids were born in some town in some city in Kazakhstan so that they don't live with the stigma of being a kid who was born under these circumstances. I thought this was interesting. So, Bruce, I don't also like to keep you away from the microphone. Please jump in. As I said, uh, we have a lot to learn from our colleagues here. So any any contribution you could make into the in, in terms of the question, I would really appreciate that. So about the other thing, uh, Shahida, so h- how the authorities are evaluating the, the success or the failure of the process is the rehabilitation process. I mean, as I can understand from your comments and also Dr. Nruba's comment, there are lots of uh, fault lines there. Yeah, but the, the, I don't think that anyone ever faced this situation before. This is unprecedented situation, and there is no uh, a blueprint, like a recipe, a treatment plan designed by the World Bank or any other organization. It's something new. Every country has to go through and, you know, figure out how to deal with these people separately. Uh, and I think Kazakhstan did an, an amazing thing. It was quite a, a courageous step, I would say, to bring all these people back and work with them. Yes, they're learning along. They're changing things. How do we evaluate success? I don't know. I think it's too early to predict, but I think Dr. Mironova is in a better position mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. Uh, talk about it than I do. I am. Mm-hmm. Dr. Mironova, yeah. Well, I think that uh, Kazakhstan government did a great thing by bringing them home, right? The mm. first country to do so, I mean, absolutely. But the question is what to do with them now. Mm. So, and not only with them, because, for example, another concern when we're talking about the, those ISIS members were not prosecuted and not in prison, right? At least for some time. Is the problem that what, what signal do we send? Do we, in Kazakhstan, for example, send a signal that it's totally fine to go to, you know, to be a member of a terrorist uh, organization, then claim that, oh, my God, like I'm a defenseless woman that who follows whoever tells me, you know, whatever they tell me to do to go. And then, you know, don't not not face consequences in a worst case scenario and in the best case scenario, even get some benefits, you know, like some startup fan to start business. What signal are we sending to others? And I know that it was already a problem in Uzbekistan. In Uzbekistan, some people, like regular people, they already raised questions why those uh, women were brought back. First of all, they were brought back by the money of the state, right? Hmm. They flew them home and now they gave them all those benefits while we have a lot of people in the country who are poor. And they didn't go anywhere. And, you know, they also need that help. So why those women are getting this preferential treatment? And, you know, then then some people are getting arrested, let's say, in Uzbekistan for some small issues, right? Like, we're not even talking about democracy problems in many of those sta- states, right? Hmm. But just minor issues. So the question that they're asking is, why in Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan you go to prison, for example, if they find some kind of radical lectures on your cell phone, well, you could basically go to ISIS, live there for four years, you know, fighting and, you know, participating in all those bad things and then come back home and the government would even protect you so you are not stigmatized. And I think it's more dangerous in general than actual fate of those, you know, let's say even 100 women. Hmm. I'm kind of speechless in how to respond to your argument here, Dr. Merov. Very, very logical point there. I mean, also, I wonder if there has to be a way to reintegrate them into the society, right? In some ways, since you brought them back from Syria with the promise that they, they will be reintegrated to the society. I mean, is it the solution to put them all of them in jail then? Well, it's not a long-term solution. I mm-hmm. agree with you. It's not a long-term solution. But let's take the example of, like, for example, United States and, and, and Tajikistan. Tajikistan mm-hmm. is going the way 
way United States is going. Mm. So the, the position of United States, we are taking everyone home, and they did take, and only according to law, you know, no feelings, no talking about, oh my God, I'm a poor woman, what can I do when a husband tells mm. me, you know, to go kill myself. You know, there is law. Adult members go to prison for membership in terrorist organization for things they did there mm. and, you know, all that. Then, at the same time, their kids go to either foster care or relative if it's confirmed that their relatives are okay. Hmm. Because keep in mind, those countries, they did not separate. Tajikistan and Uzbekistan did not separate kids from their mothers when they brought them back. Hmm. And again, mothers are the ones who radicalize kids. Just think about it. You know, we take kids in a foster care. If mother endangers her child, for example, leaving him, let's say, in a car, right? In hmm. some, that she lo loses custody of the child right away. And here we have a case when a mother took her kids to a f war zone where it's clear that a kid older than 12 goes to the military training and then joins the military. I mean, come on. Isn't it a clear case of endangering a child, you know, as clear as it could possibly humanly get? So in that case, so what U.S. does, the individual person, you know, adult member goes to prison. Kids go to foster care because they need to be separated from those absolutely, you know, not mothers who already put them in prison. You know, it's not that we're thinking, oh, my God, like she's into ISIS, so maybe she's dangerous. No, we have a case. You know, she brought him to the war zone. So at the, that time, while woman, or man or woman is in prison, first of all, they actually understand that maybe they did something wrong, right? Hmm. And the, the trial is very public, so everyone, you know, could see that basically you should not go to ISIS, right, or any other terrorist organization, because you would face consequences, go to prison. And then after they are released, then we do reassessment, right, mm. and think, did she change? Would she be a danger to her kids or the kids could be returned to her? This is the way U.S. went. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's how it's done here in America. And by the way, that's how it's now done in Tajikistan. All those kids, they brought around 80 kids from Baghdad. A woman there are in prison and they would be there, let's say, mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. So uh, they brought those kids and Tajikistan says, when I asked them, I was like, okay, so did you give it to grandparents? And they were like, yeah, we wish. But the problem is that when we did assessment of those grandparents or whatever sisters you know close relatives we found out that half of them are actually also very much into isis they just you know failed to go themselves so we could not give those kids there so the kids are now in a foster care you since you brought up tajikistan you know it's interesting uh, what you are saying you know tajikistan's name doesn't often uh, come up in such a way where this country can be stated as an example of how to do something right you know given um the painful uh, ground realities of on so many levels in the country. But um, what are the evidence that Tajikistan's heavy-handed approach is, in fact, effective? I mean, how do we know this approach is indeed working when, when it's compared with the other, other countries in Central Asia? Oh, first of all, I would say that Tajikistan is very open. Like, I would say it's the first when I asked all the countries in the mm. region to send me actual statistics about how many they brought in kids, you know, rearrested mm. case trials. They were the first to respond. So they gave me all the statistics about how many people amnested, how many people were arrested with types of sentences and mm. so on. Mm. So, yeah. no, I don't. I think in that case, I know that Tajikistan has some problems, right? But in that case, I think they're pretty open. I was surprised. If this issue is successful and, and it works in, in Tajikistan, well, we, first of all, we would not see for quite some time, right? Mm. But I think it does. Like, at least it's, it's according to law, right? That mm. what they do is according to law. So people know that they should not be going to some kind of shady terrorist organizations because, you know, you get to prison. You don't want to do that, right? Mm. And, yeah, kids are now in a foster care and mm. uh, in a government. Mm. And as far as I know, conditions are quite okay. Mm. You know, just a regular foster, ho foster home, nothing special for ISIS mm. members, mm. right? And also, but also they ra they raised the question with one particular kid. I think he's like 12 or 14 and they said that they had, had a problem with him because being 12 and 14 and he was placed in this orphanage and he started like ruling it. He's saying, oh my God, like I'm a great mm. Mujahid mm. and you all have to follow me and you know, I went to Syria and you're all kids mm. and nothing, mm. so come follow me. So they have to 
brewhouse. Mm. Yeah, the, the so they're very open about those problems. Yeah, well, openness might be something, but you know, um, it's very complicated picture out there. I have perhaps mm-hmm. nothing to say otherwise in terms of the points you are making about the specific approach. But you know, we know any type of religious devotion or uh, religious activity can put you in trouble in Tajikistan. We know how the authorities are using this as a pretext to persecute people. And um, what I'm what I'm saying is, generally speaking, Tajikistan is chart is very complicated on this matter. No, no, no. I I totally agree with you and I don't comment on that. But, you know, maybe, you know, you should not put people in prison for, you know, having Quran or something Mm -hmm. like that, right? But, I mean, membership in a terrorism organization. Mm -hmm. Uh, By the way, every country, every country we're talking about signed a UN memorandum that, Mm -hmm. you know, they how to deal with those returned foreign fighters. and, And they all signed a memorandum saying that it's a crime to join ISIS, mm, right? Mm. And, you know, they ratified it at home. They mm. just, other countries just not following through with that. Right, right. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Mironova. Very insightful. Bruce, you know, um, though we need to wrap up the discussion very soon here, I'm just looking into my some of my own final points. Oh, yeah. We also wanted to talk about the fundamental issues that uh, triggered the mobilization of many of those people in the first place to the Middle East, whether anything is done on that front. Um, I mean, bringing these people back and trying to, you know, solve this problem through humane way of rehabilitation efforts by Central Asian authorities, while most countries on earth look the other way, are very applaudable um, effort and deserving praise. But if this problem was to be resolved, those fundamental issues also need to be tackled. Uh, Bruce, I guess my question expand it, you know, and just to make a long story short, whether the authorities learned a lesson from this entire saga so that when another terrorist group emerge in other parts of the world, we do not see the same scenario being repeated against. Well, I'm not really sure what lesson um, they could they could learn from this. You know, mm-hmm. it's a, what happened to the people in Central Asia is the same thing that happened to people from countries all over the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, people went for for an assortment of reasons. And actually, you you gave me an opportunity to ask a question that I wanted to ask mm-hmm. our guests too. Is that um, you know, in some places we've seen that it's people that for whatever reason believed that that was that we had a religious duty or something. There was something there that they thought was a, a call that they should have to listen to. Mm-hmm. You know, that had to do with their faith. But yet, when we saw the you know when I was watching um, Shahid his film one of the young women said she didn't know anything about islam at all really you know Mm. she went because her husband went and then we've heard that that you know uh from both our guests that that seems to be the case so i'm really kind of curious i don't i don't know what the governments can do in central asia but i think the interesting thing is how much of this even had to do and you you know since our guests have interviewed these um, these people and and spoken with theologians how much of this ever had to do with islam at all as far as the people who have who have been returned. I mean, it seems like there's a lot of selfish reasons or reasons of, of some sense of duty to a husband or something like that. But I, I don't get the impression that, that people, you know, equate this or, or see that this was part of some religious duty, at least the people that we've been talking about with the women and stuff. That doesn't seem to be why they went. Is because they thought that this was their duty under Islam to do. They had other entirely different reasons for going, you know, and, and so I was curious about that. Mm. Any Anyone to respond to this? Well, I, I totally agree with this point. Actually, I have a book about exactly that. A religion is something they use to basically cover everything else. So, for example, let's take, if we're talking about Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan had one of the biggest uh, groups in, uh, like, Katiba's units inside ISIS of foreign fighters. It was huge. It was, like, 1,500, gigantic. So, who do you think, who was the leader, uh, who was an Amir? Let's call him Amir, you know, they call him Mm. Amir, religious name, right? Now, of this group, and uh, our religious leader of Kazakh Jamaat in ISIS just happened to be a former Smatryashi on Shemkan. Hmm. Smatryashi is like a criminal word for the hmm. guy being in charge of criminal life of the city. Hmm. So I'm not, you know, like, how can you get from Smatryashi to Amir? Hmm. It's a very big stretch to me, right? But he <laughs> happened to also have four Yazidi slaves, you know, everything that comes with a nice upgrade from Smatryashi in Shemkan to Amir. In, in Kazakh Jamaat in ISIS. And there were a lot of them. So if you look at the individual cases, which I did for many, many, many members, I mean, almost all of them have a previous criminal conviction. Majority of them, which, was, which is hilarious, at least from Russia, is on drugs. So drug trade. 
drug trade racketeering, two main criminal charges uh, before they magically decided that, you know, jihad is calling them. So, of course, no wonder, first, there were a lot of drug addicts inside ISIS, right? Because they basically returned to wherever they were doing before going to beautiful lands of, you know, Iraq and Syria. But also all this stuff was like stealing individual property and they're selling it, buying slaves and all this basically fun stuff. So when someone uh, of that nature tells me something about Islam and they're like, oh, but I changed when I was doing my third time in prison for drugs. I'm like, wow, you really found God here, right? And then you decided to go to Syria. I mean, you kidding me? Or um, when we talk about Russians, we have a lot of disproportional number of former now Nazis who, again, magically decided that they need to, you know, believe in Islam and go to Syria. But basically, the case is that they could not do whatever they wanted to do when they joined neo-Nazis. For example, killing people on the street. But then there was a great opportunity to do so in Syria. And what do you need to do? Ah, convert to Islam and pray five times a day. Well, not hard. We'll do that. I literally know a person who has a tattoo on his chest. On one side, it's Hitler, and on the other side, it's an ISIS black flag. Like, I mean, what, what kind of, you know, a religious duty we're talking about here? Yeah. And well, now they could only say that because a lot of people, you know, are afraid to kind of deal with this religion, you know, not to offend anyone, you know, we're not discriminative. So they are now extremely pushing about it. First, you know, appealing to the sexist idea of a lot of males in governments, especially in, in Central Asian former Soviet Union, by saying, oh, my God, I just followed a husband. And of course, you know, a lot of males working in the same KGB and a lot of males in general in a country, the audience are like, of course she did the right thing. How we could punish her for this nice behavior? And, you know, she said that she did it for God. And a lot of people, again, would be afraid to touch this issue. But it is not to expand the conversation. But this is also true, isn't it, in Central Asian society, at least in some cases, that those women indeed follow their husband, isn't it? I mean, there might be some radicals. Well, I, uh, no, no, no. I, I congratulate them with, them with that. That's good. But imagine, let's say I'm a wife in some Central Asian country hmm. and my husband happened to sell drugs, right? Just ha- imagine hmm. And uh, he tells me to take this package with drugs and bring it to her, his whatever friend, you know, God knows where. And I get arrested in the middle of it. And then, you know, I say, by the way, I mean, what can I do? My husband, it's my husband who asked me to move those drugs there. (laughs) Or I'm not a chemistrist, right? I don't know what's in there. It's just a white bag with, you know, something that looks like cocaine. I mean, would you treat me the same way? Hmm. It sounds like we are kind of coming back to what we have already discussed. But very lastly, Shahida, on Dr. Mironova's points on how those women should be dealt with versus the way they are being currently treated. You know, in some ways, this has been the culture in Central Asia, right, that women are uh, expected to follow their husbands. While I say this, by no means I endorse this culture. But as a Central Asian, Shahida, you know how the traditional way of family looks like in the region. I'm I'm kind of putting you in a, in a an uncomfortable position to respond to Dr. Mironova's points, but how does this argument sound like from a Central Asian perspective? In many Mohammed, cases, but everyone is equal before the law, yeah, man or sure. woman, respectively. The law should apply to everyone. And it, it's not related to what gender you are. You know, you're you have to be treated as a separate individual, not an attachment to your husband. So I followed my husband's situation. Doesn't really cut it for me. To be honest, these women went believing in what their husbands were telling them. Now, the level of their religious education, knowledge of Islam was absolutely minimal or none at all. You know, and on top of that, and we're talking now in a particular area of Kazakhstan, which is quite dull, quite infrastructurally backward. It's Uralsk, it's Aktube, mm. it's quite cold there almost half a year of one year of 12 months. It's desperate and destitution. Here comes Islamic ideology or some sort of ideology and salvation. And actually, the you know what I, what I call it? The way they, preachers or whatever, I don't really know how to call these people, are explaining religion to them is like McDonald's style. 
you know there is five rules six rules all you need to know the way the brainwashing goes is is very effective because okay you're in a bad situation things are bad the government is bad the corruption is there this is your way forward here's a leaflet with five uh, five things you need to know and yalla go uh, do hijra you know we open mm. for you the gates of paradise and the ignorance in all levels you know educational whatever plays its role too so yes they these women did follow but they had a choice and all of them said that they had a choice but they decided to go because of they were afraid of one one thing another thing or they decided to follow their husbands it doesn't make them less criminal than their husbands from my point of view and we should be absolutely fair you know honest about it with all my with all the sympathy with all the uh, women who agreed to talk to me I think they've been through so many things because we don't know what they were dealing with that certain amount of punishment should take should happen. Mm-hmm. A few of the girls you've seen in the film are now walking around, I mean, doing some lectures and seminars, talking to wider audiences about the dangers of uh, radical Islam. And uh, one of them is enrolled in university to study religion, but this is the minimal. I would say Kazakhstan has a bigger problem of internal radicalization without even returnees from ISIS. And I could see the signs of it in the streets and in the markets, you know, and it's it's quite worrying. It's, mm. it, the, the authorities really have to keep an eye mm. on these mm. returnees as well as on the internal grooming of these mm, people mm-hmm. of potential mm. you know terrorists so, yeah thank you shahida you know it's 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 been a very eye opener conversation for the past uh, one hour i know we have so many uh, other things to talk about perhaps we could uh, come back to this uh, some other time but uh, here we need to conclude the discussion perhaps you might have some opinion about the final question that i have in mind dr mironova so here we are some of the central asian countries brought back hundreds of their citizens from the Middle East for whatever purpose they had in mind. And they are applying policies that they think fit for their needs, which clearly differ from each other, like Tajikistan having a heavy hand, Uzbekistan not so much, in Kazakhstan somewhere in the middle, and Turkmenistan remaining in darkness as in many other cases. So on top of that, the approach by the authorities seemed to be not very effective as our colleagues have been talking about. In the meantime, things are once more sharply deteriorating in neighboring Afghanistan. Taliban are taking over district after districts in the areas bordering Central Asia. And there are hundreds of Central Asian fighters lying low across those bordering towns in Afghanistan. So what I'm saying is, where does this put the region as to what comes next and where our eyes should be going forward? Well, uh, we actually didn't talk about Kyrgyzstan at all, but like I'm concerned about Kyrgyzstan. Mm. Kyrgyzstan is a country where I have the biggest number of male uh, ISIS members walking around freely because guess why? Any court could be, you know, bought for fifteen thousand dollars. And um, Kyrgyzstan, you know, they could be they, they didn't repatriate women yet because they are like discussing and not sure what to do. But I mean, anyone who wanted to come back, males, they already back with the new clean documents and, and so on for fifteen thousand. And so I, I'm very not optimistic about the region in general because uh, there is not only there is no control about ISIS uh, stuff at all. A lot of those countries, the countries are too close to Afghanistan, which is now a stronghold. And you know what happened yesterday with Tajikistan? That, by the way, one of the reasons why Tajikistan is like we're not playing with those, you know, beautiful, lovely ISIS wives. And, you know, we, we are too close to Afghanistan to be messing with that. But also Afghanistan is too close. They could go there. There is no control. And the countries, as Shahida said, they had been coming more islamic themselves i remember in, in uzbekistan there is already a discussion about separate education between boys and girls so of course you know what kind of a following law we could say if you know some countries are getting more radicalized by themselves you know from the head of the fish so i i'm, I'm extremely concerned plus uh, even i'm concerned for other countries because as you know a lot of terrorist attacks or planned terrorist attacks in europe were done by folks from Central Asia, right? I'm not talking 
talking about the big one, the loudest one, like Paris. But former Soviet Union is all over there, including, you know, Russia, also Central Asia mm-hmm. and Russia, right? The uh, Uzbek guy in Stockholm, the Chechen guy in France. Now, five Tajiks who are planning to do an attack in Germany. And by the way, three of those five Tajiks were on Tajikistan wanted list when they were they still managed somehow to get to Germany. Ah, Istanbul, right? Istanbul attack on the airport. Although it was run by a Chechen with Georgian citizen, right? All perpetrators were from Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan. Hmm. So I'm extremely... Ah, oh, of course, United States. Our beautiful Uzbek truck driver who drove his truck into the crowd. So, I mean, it's not a Central Asia problem. It's a, it's a gigantic problem now for the whole world. But and it, Central Asia is failing epically. Mm, it's a major problem. But on Central Asia, though, Bruce, perhaps you would like to jump in here. Um, you know, we have been so far criticizing Central Asian authorities that they are having heavy hand on anything religion, perhaps over using ideology as a pretext to even crack down against their own opponents. And there is no shortage of examples like that. And now, in this conversation, some of our colleagues have criticized Central Asian authorities for not having a heavy-handed approach on, at least in the context of those returnees from Syria. Uh, So where we stand and where the region stands in this long-standing question going forward? Yeah, I mean, listening to our guests, I would have to say that they might have underestimated the threat um, from this one. You know, it's again, it's always been strange to me that these people seem to vanish when they get into the countries. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't hear anything good or bad about them. And I suppose that, you know, you ask, like, where my eyes will be at waiting for one of these apparently ticking time bombs that they've let loose in the country to go off and bring attention back to who they brought mm-hmm. home. Mm. Um, from these areas. I mean, hopefully that won't happen, but it sounds like um, it's inevitable in one of these countries sooner or later that one of these people is who hasn't really repented or been rehabilitated um, is going to do something and draw attention to, unfortunately, everybody that's been brought back. And, and I know the governments in the region have gotten some rare positive international praise for, you know, taking this step and bringing these people back. But, uh, you know, again, judging from the conversation, listening to our guests, I'd have to say, you know, it, it seems like it's only a matter of time until one person at least um, shows that they haven't been successful in rehabilitating some people. OK, um, very briefly, Shahida, where, where your eyes will be, I mean, as someone who just did this project with a fresh eye on, on this problem. So where are your eyes going to be in immediate future as to how things will develop going forward from here? Well, I would love to really get to Uzbekistan and find out what mm. happens to the women and mm. children returned to Uzbekistan, mm. because these stories we don't know about. Mm. You know, mm. we, we've heard a lot, but the Uzbeks were this community, and there were a lot of them, mm. a lot. And I want to hear this story, you know. I want to follow up and see what's happening. But mm. me as a documentary filmmaker, I'm not an analyst. I'm an observer. Mm. And that's exactly what Bruce said. My job was to go and find out what happened afterwards. Mm. I'm just uh, documenting <laughs> what mm. was happening, mm. and we'll see. We'll see. It's very difficult to predict, and I'm not in a prediction business, so mm. I'm just uh, stating what is obvious. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's amazing how time flies. I wasn't expecting this discussion to last that long, but, you know, anyhow, it was a great conversation, and it was great to listen to your perspectives. But let's end the conversation here. Thank you very much, Dr. Vera Mirunova, the research fellow at the Harvard University. Shahida Tuliganova, award-winning documentary filmmaker and the author of The Second Chance, the documentary that we discussed about today, about the ISIS returnees to Kazakhstan, and Bruce Panier, the editor of Radio Free Radio Liberty, Central Asia blog, Kishlok Owasi. Again, thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues, for your time and thoughts today. And this is from me, Mohammed Tahir, Radio Free Radio Liberty's media manager and host of the Majlis podcast here in Washington, D.C. Until next week, bye-bye.